Welcome Generation Sisterhood. I'm so excited tonight to welcome you to our Fall Girls Night In. Yes, we're coming to you live virtually in the comfort of your own homes, gathered around maybe with friends, and maybe you're at one of our Generation's house parties tonight. Well, by now, you have maybe already experienced some of the amazing giveaways that we had planned for you tonight. But what we're getting ready to do right now is we are getting ready to come together and have a powerful time of worship from Pastor Indy and our Church Alive worship team. What this is going to do is it's going to prepare our hearts to receive the powerful word that our guest speaker, Hashmarine Griffin, is going to be bringing to us. So sit back. Actually, don't sit back. Get up. Give an elbow punch to your sister friend that's sitting beside you. And let's get ready to receive. I want to scream it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my Just hold on. 
for the dawn will soon arise Can you feel the winds are changing? There's a new day on the rise And the atmosphere is breaking As a new world comes to life And we will sing, we will dance Till the earth that goes to heaven Sing His praise till we see
you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good yeah you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn to welcome with a huge Church Alive Generation Sisterhood welcome to our virtual Girls Night In guest speaker, Hoshmarine Griffin. She is going to bless your heart this evening. She's going to bring a powerful word that will encourage us and strengthen us as we finish 2020 strong. Get ready. Hello, Generation Ladies. This is Hashmarine Griffin, all the way from Daytona Beach, Florida. I am so excited that I get to come into your living room tonight and be a part of your girl's evening. I hope all your friends are gathered and you're relaxed on the couch. I'm sitting here in my living room. I kicked all the men out of my house. So it's just me and the dog, our dog Bentley. Hopefully she'll be well behaved. And I get to come in and share with you a little bit about myself. And I also wanted to thank you so much, Pastor Laura, for letting me come in and uh, talk to all of you tonight. Again, if you missed it, my name is Hosh Marine Griffin. You've probably met my husband who's come in and preached at Church Alive before. And uh, I am from Sri Lanka. 
It's a little island, a tropical island. It's absolutely gorgeous off the coast of India. I was born there. And um, I just wanted to share one of my scariest, uh, I would say one of my loneliest times in my life uh, when I was in Sri Lanka. I was probably about eight years old and my parents had sent us to boarding school because our local schools weren't as good. So we actually were about two hours away and we uh, stayed at a boarding school. And at this boarding school, um, there was maybe about, you know, 30 kids in the home. And every weekend my parents would come to pick us up. And I remember at about four o'clock every Friday evening, standing there at the gate at the boarding school, waiting for someone, my parents to come get us. And one of those nights was probably the most devastating, scariest nights of my life. There was some sort of a civil war, which I didn't understand why, was going on. And all the homes were caught on fire. There were cars burning. There were people um, set on fire. There were children in cars. There were women in cars. And they were getting beaten. It was devastating. And soon as I noticed my dad pulling up that Friday evening to pick us up to go home for the weekend, I hopped in the car and I was in the back seat just watching all of this mass chaos. All of the homes down that street were on fire and the fires were even contagious so they were burning all the neighborhoods in the area. Trees are on fire, I mean just fire everywhere. People were running and hiding. There were um, men with bats and sticks and huge torches uh, with flames, um, you know, lighting more things on fire and beating up each other. That's all I remembered. And as we approached after a two hour drive, uh, we o approached our town, I remember that there was like a roadblock and there were all these people there and these men were coming into the cars and pulling people out and beating them up. And I knew that we were going to not survive that night. I just knew in my eight year old brain that we were not gonna survive that night. And in the back seat of my car, I just said, Lord, please, please save us. And right then there was a man that showed up with a huge bat and he grabbed my dad out of the car and he questioned my dad i couldn't hear and then the next thing i know he said get in the car and go and he let us leave and to this day i thought god your glory fell that night i have no idea what happened but it was a miracle so we drove home, we get to the house and we are all in hiding and people were knocking on our doors, asking us to hide them, to send us, you know, put, put them somewhere in, in our garden, under a bush, in a tree, somewhere, just hide them because people were coming for them. As I got older, I learned that our country was in a civil war due to educational issues. You see, our country had two major languages. One was called Sinhalese, which is the mother tongue. And then the other one was called Tamil, which was kind of a mi minority spoken language, um, kind of derived from Southern India. And the government decided to change the school system and teach everybody in one language. So all the people that had studied in Tamil you know, from kindergarten all the way to like 11th grade, now all of a sudden has to learn this new language. So this causes massive uproar. It created a guerrilla movement and total riots and chaos, much like what we're seeing today in the US. It was such a scary time. And my dad, he actually looks very Tamil. And so that's why he was stopped because we were the minority and we were about to get killed. But because my dad was a respected, amazing man of God in our community, the man that grabbed him out of the car recognized him and said, you can go. 
Thank God for that, right? So fast forward two years, ever since that scary night, I remember kneeling on, on our, getting down on our knees and kneeling and praying with my family every single night that God would help us come to America so we could have a better future. Now the waiting list for a visa was like 15 years during that time. And it was beyond a miracle that we actually got it after three years. So we finally come to America three years later in 1983. I happened to be 10 years old. And, um, you know, I remember landing in Seattle, Washington. That's where I grew up. It being super cold. This is December. All of the leaves are gone. Here I come from this tropical land. All I saw was branches and just this dry, cold air. It was crazy. So we finally get in and I thought, man, you know, this is gonna be a new adventure for us. This is what we've been praying for, you know, for the last three years as a family and believing God to help us. So here we are in the US. Fast forward four years and um, I was a tomboy. Everyone who knows me from back then would know. I was a tomboy. If you were looking for me, I was always up in a tree I was playing football, baseball, soccer with all the boys in the neighborhood. That's what I like to do. And so when I was 14, um, I was in the shopping mall with my mother and I was discovered by an agency, a modeling agency from New York. And my mom said, oh my gosh, this is awesome because now, I don't have to worry about my daughter acting and looking like a boy. You know, maybe she can learn how to wear makeup and put on some heels and Lord help us, please have her put on a dress. And maybe she'll find a husband or in her accent, she'll, she'll say, oh, finally, my daughter is going to marry a good boy. So anyway, I thought, okay, Lord, if this is your will, I will do it. So that started a 16 year old modeling career for me. And I got to travel all over the world. I traveled in Australia, Italy, England, um, did all of the fashion weeks in New York, LA, Miami. Uh, I walked for um, lots, walking means runway. And um, I got to model for huge fashion designers like Valentino, Oscar de la Renta, Gianni Versace, Donna Karen, just to name a few. And it was an absolute blast. I enjoyed every moment of it. But during that time, I remember thinking about, man, you know, I'm in the spotlight. The cameras are on me. I had all of the praises of God. I mean, I'm sorry, I had all the praises of humans and man. And I remember thinking, God, you know, I want more in my life. I want your glory to follow me. I want your covering all over me. I wanna worship you and I wanna praise you. And what was so cool was God really showed me that it wasn't about man's glory or it wasn't about um, you know, being famous or, you know, being in the top echelon in this amazing industry, but it was about seeking after his own heart. And he showed me that there was always going to be somebody smarter than you, someone more beautiful than you, someone more talented than you, someone more well-spoken than you, that the number one thing is to love him with all your heart. And so later on in my life, I ended up meeting a preacher. So here is this model married to a preacher, which is crazy. It was the melding of two awesome, awesome industries, but crazy combination of the two. We had the most colorful wedding and I had all of these models and, um, you know, aunties and saris on one side and then I had all the preachers in black and navy suits on the other side, you know. It was the funniest scene you'd ever see. 
But during that union, I learned that God's glory was all over us. He had such a plan for my life from coming from a country of turmoil and fear um, to this great nation that we live in today, that we have so much freedom and that I absolutely love. And to be a part of the world of the church and the faith community, I thought was amazing. And during these times, you know, where I felt afraid and lonely, God also gave me something that I thought was so unbelievable. A scripture is one of my favorite scriptures that I live by to this day. And I just wanted to share a little bit with you. It is Psalms 22. When God was on the cross and he was dying, people were spitting on him, he was bleeding, he was um, sworn at, he was talked about, he was ridiculed, he was mocked, he was kicked, he was urinated on. During this whole time, as he was dying, one of his last words was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I remember reading that going, wow, Lord, like, even even during this time you're 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 asking God to come and and you know just help him save him during this time of pain and as i got older and i married dr alan griffin i realized that um god was actually praying and he was praising god he was praising God during a time that he was dying. And I thought, man, you know, why, why do we go through things in life? Why do we have obstacles? Why do we have pain and suffering? So we can always glorify God. If you had a bill of health that was negative from your doctor, you know, we wouldn't even know the healer if we didn't need healing. If you were broke and you're about to have your home shut down, you wouldn't need the provider unless we needed him at that moment. And so I wanted to share this scripture with you because I thought it was so powerful. Because some theologians believe that God was actually saying a prayer. And this is Psalms 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he ends up dying because he was so weak to say the rest. But I want to tell you what he was trying to say. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you are fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Boy, he continues to praise him during this time. It just blows my mind every time I read that. And there's so much more because it's verse 1 through 31. Please take a, take a moment and, and read it when you can. But while Jesus was dying on the cross and he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? He was actually just worshiping God and giving him glory. As he was bleeding, he was praising the Lord. And every time I read this passage, I just think, man, I need to use this more in my life where I give him the glory. And so I just wrote down here, you know, because I think about our purpose in this world, and that is to give him glory. Give him glory in your darkest moments 
You give him glory during your loneliness. You give him glory when you are in anguish. You give him glory even when you are spiritually bleeding. And these times of giving God glory is when we find our purpose. Sisters, tonight, our purpose is to live out our lives under God's glory. Through his glory comes joy. Through his glory comes peace. Through his glory comes miracles. And through his glory comes our freedom. This is where we can dwell under God's glory. Amen. I just thought that was so powerful. I just wanted to share that with you tonight. And tonight, before we go, I would like to say a prayer that we say um, every day in our family, and I want to share it with you. Please close your eyes and bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, you are the God of the breakthrough and the God of the turnaround. You take what the devil means for bad and you turn it into something good. For you are good and you are the source of good. Your word declares no weapon formed against us will prosper and triumph over opposition. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. You're the God who preserves and the God who vindicates the faithful. You're the God who leads us into victory in every transition and every changing season of our lives. You're the God who teaches us to profit and the God who restores everything that Satan has stolen. We have nothing to fear because you are for us and you are by our side. And if our God is for us, then no one can successfully be our enemy. You will not abandon us in our trouble and you will not allow our adversary to pray, prevail over us. Your goodness awaits us. We will wait on you and we will not waver. We're now thinking in advance because we know that our God reigns and our God will not let us fail. In Jesus' name, we expect your goodness and we rejoice in your loving kindness. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, ladies, for letting me kind of tell you a little bit about myself. And I hope uh, what I shared just blessed someone tonight. Love you. Have a great night. Bye. Hey, ladies, one important announcement that I want to make sure that you are aware of for all those girls who call Church Alive home and your friends who love to also come with you to our Generations events. Unfortunately, this year, we are not going to be able to host our 2020 Ladies Holiday Gala. For some of you, maybe you had already heard it was going to be at a barn in Fuquay. So just know we are making full plans for 2021. We're excited about what's to come, but I wanted to make sure you heard it directly from me. This year, we're going to have to just delay our holiday gala celebration, and we will look forward to all that God has for us in 2021.